So we're going to start on lecture six now, the last one for today. And it's part two of PIV, Analysis, Examples, and Limitations. So again, our goal is to describe data analysis this time. We talked last lecture was going over the hardware, if you will, the lasers, the optics, and particles. Now we're going to look at the data analysis and then measure limitations for PIV. So we'll look at the effects of experimental par parameter variation. We'll look at cross-correlation analysis. Uh, the classic PIV design rules where they, they came from, really how you set up an experiment. Uh, extensions to a little bit on stereo and tomographic PIV. And again, uh, some limitations in terms of spatial, spatial resolution. And then just a slide or two in challenges of reacting flows. These can be characterized very, fairly quickly uh, for just a, a couple, of, couple of issues. All right, so let's quickly get some definition terminology that I'll use here. This, if we have a, a complete image, I will refer to this as a particle field image or an ensemble of particle images. This is a particle image. The reason is, is that you have a real particle in the flow field and then you, you have the transfer of the image of that individual particle. So this is not a particle image, this is a particle image, okay? So a singular particle. So the question that we should ask ourselves, the first question is how dense should our seeding be? Again, how much seed can we put into the flow? So we need to find two terms, uh, source density and image density. So here's the definition of the source density. And let's go ahead and jump to, uh, we'll, we'll go over each one of these uh, in detail. Um, so the source density is essentially a normalized representation of the type of image that's going to be recorded. So let's define some uh, quantities and then we'll come back to that. Uh, we, again, we have our tracer concentration C, we have our laser sheet thickness, uh, magnification, and then we have pi over D, and DI is the image diameter. If you remember, that's the actual particle diameter squared with the appropriate magnification. And then we have the blur of the system. Okay, so it's the sum of the squares. And then we, and then we end up, we have, to, we have a blur of the camera, and if it's diffraction limit, it's this. Remember, it can be worse as well. Okay? But whatever your blur is, we would put in here. And that turns out to be your image diameter. So again, the image diameter is telling you what you're actually seeing on your camera. Okay? We have the blur component, and then we have the magnification times the real particle diameter. So that's what the definition of the image diameter is. Okay? And then the image diameter gets fed in into this term. And you see this is really a normalization through concentration and then essentially a volume. Okay? And so if you look at what the source density, again, it's the type. If your NS is less than 1, you end up what you pick up what's called individual particle image. That means on each time you see a feature like this, any one of these distinct features, that is a direct transfer from the actual particle that's in the flow onto your camera. Okay? When your NS becomes greater than 1, your number density has become too high such that when the light goes and interacts with an individual particle, you're going to have scattering from the two particles, but because they're so dense that scattering is so close, they end up constructively uh, and, and, and interfering and destructively interfering with one another. And you end up getting a speckle pattern. Okay? So very similar to as if you take a high coherence laser and put it on like a card, you see the laser speckle. Okay? The reason that is is because on a, on a sheet of paper, uh, each little molecule fiber of the paper can be considered a particle that's really close and their scattering light is interfering with each other. And what you see off is a speckle pattern. We can't do PIV with speckle patterns. The speckle patterns, although at one instantaneous of time, generates a pattern, but that pattern actually will change. Even if you perfectly advected the particle and had no out of plane, the pattern would be different. Just natural changes in the flow, turbulent fluctuations will change the speckle pattern. Okay, so that cannot be used for PIV analysis. So we need to make sure that we have a source diameter, if you will, that satisfies uh, much less than one, okay? or at least less than one. Okay, the image density is defined in this manner. Okay, and so let's, let's take a look at what we mean by, by this. And I'm trying to be consistent with uh, kind of the original nomenclature that was put out, so as you go to PIV text, 
we have our concentration, our tracer concentration in terms of cube, uh, inverse cubic meters, light sh sheet thickness, image magnification. And when we say here interrogation spot diameter, think of this as the size of the interrogation window. I know you think of them mostly as square, so just think of them as the size of that interrogation region. That's what this is, okay? And so the image density represents the mean number of particles in an interrogation window. So for PIV, kind of the image, uh, the image density uh, should be greater than about 10 to 15. Uh, and so uh, what you have in a correlation, for example, in 16 by 16, this is a particles per pixel is about 0.05, okay? We'll discuss this in a moment. You can have more. You certainly can have more, and we'll actually show that as long as you're not putting too much that you end up getting speckled. The more you put, the actual stronger your correlation is. Okay, but there are re this is sort of a minimum guideline, and there's other reasons for maybe not putting too too many in there. Okay, so again, let's ask ourselves how dense the seating should be. Let's look at some examples. Let's say the image density is order one, meaning I put a single particle in my interrogation window. I just have one. Okay, fluid motion is determined by tracking a pattern of particles. Right now, this is such general language. Whether I directly track them or I use correlation, really we're all tracking patterns, okay? So let's say, so what you can see is if the density is low, then the distance between any two particles, in this case is one, or even if we have two, the distance between the particles is greater than the particle displacement, okay? So this particle moved here and this particle moved here. So if the distance between the two particles is low, I mean, sorry, the distance between the particles is greater than the particle displacement, if you can do that, you can actually calculate the distance of individual particles, right? There's not, there's not a bias or there's not an ambiguity here. So again, think about if, you're, if you have an interrogation window and it's uh, statistically, we have to think about this, is that if your seating is so low, the distance between any two particles, such that when they move over a small delta t, whatever they move, you can still tell which particle went with the other one, okay? And you do that, and that's called particle tracking velocity, the particle tracking velocimetry, or PTV, okay? Okay? But although you get the displacement in individual particles, the information from a quote-unquote image is very low, okay? You only have a few particles, you only have a few velocity vectors, okay? So we, if we want higher yield, we have to go to a higher image density, so we put in a lot more particles, Here's a representation, here's image one. This says one, two, three, four, five, nine particles in it. And then at image two, they moved, okay? So now image one, I believe, are the white circles and image two are the black. You have to ask yourselves where, which belongs with which, okay? So now what happens is the density increases, the number of particles that exist in interrogation window is the spacing between any adjacent particles starts to become comparable, okay, or less than the displacement. I wrote it here, the, the particle displacement is greater than the spacing between the particles, okay? So the particles cannot be matched unambiguously. You, you could get some right, you could guess, but you can't properly match them, right? And so you can't do a simple particle track. And so that's why you need a statistical approach for this quote-unquote pattern, ma pattern matching, okay? And again, this is the concept, or this is the idea between the analysis and particle image, uh, particle image velocity, should be imaging, PIV. And the information that you get from the image is much higher, okay? So again, just a quick, if you have low number density of particles, low image density, you can track each individual particle, okay? This is PTV. Now, if you use higher, uh, but you get low information, higher amount of uh, number of particles in your interrogation window, you get more information, the amount of information that's coming from the image is richer, but you can't uh, track them individually and you need a statistical pro approach to analyze the data, okay? So let's look at this case where Ni is much, much greater than one. If we look at this, we, again, we can't match them by proximity. That's another way to say PTV. We, we match them by proximity. If I take a look at any one of this, partic this particle, let's say, remember the image one plus two, the, the white images are particle image one, 
the black or particle image two, did this particle get move to there, there, there? Probably not that one, but did it move there? Probably not that one, there. Maybe that one's strong or that one. We don't know, right? You could, you could draw, you could say, okay, the uncertainty in how the particles move there. Uh, it, it's, it's uncertain. But we can use correlation analysis. Okay, let's consider a single particle. And really, correlation is really just a summation of distance histograms. This is a very old way of thinking about it, but this is actually a correct way, an easy way to think of what, what the correlation is doing. You can actually take a single particle and look at, all the, look at the histogram of all possible matches. But it, let's say if we look at one single particle, okay, and we look at the histogram to all these possible, at, for one particle, it's just however many particles is unity, right? That's just the histogram. It has the probability of moving there, 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 there. So, but we know only one of these is correct. But now then if we take every uh, particles, okay, the, only the matching particle pairs will add up, and a sharp peak will start to form, okay? So if you add up, take all the particles and attempt to match them with all of them, okay, you eventually you'll start to suppress all these spurious uh, ones that are random, and one correct answer uh, will appear. And that's essentially a displacement histogram over all particles within a certain region. So again, you're looking at the statistical approach where you're looking at what the essentially the statistics of all the particles in your interrogation box are moving, okay? And there'll be, quote unquote, one answer. Well, when I say only one is correct, this is, again, becomes the most probable displacement of these particles within this box. And that's not really how we do it, but we'll, we'll explain that in a second. So what are, what are we first going to do? How are we going to look at uh, estimating particle motion? Well, first we're going to say, okay, let's imagine we have a single interrogation window. So we've divided our image. We have a single interrogation window. We have particles that have light and we have dark. What we can do is get the mean intensity from the interrogation window, okay? And then what we can do, uh, I prime is just the intensity fluctuation. So we, we have any at any, if you will, pixel at any location in that interrogation box, we can, uh, we can get the intensity fluctuation from the mean, okay? And then we get the, the, correlation, uh, the correlation coefficient. Let me explain this just so we're not uh, uh, incredibly overwhelmed. All this is, it's really actually, think about it, this is image A and we have image B. So lowercase image A, image B, right? We're trying to correlate two images, okay? So all we're saying is image, uh, sorry, we can, we can take um, interrogation window A, interrogation window B, from image A and image B, okay. Uh, so what we have is we have that B, X, and B, Y are just the number of pixels. We should have that. We have the number of pix total number of pixels in the X and Y window. And then we have the kth and the lth pixel. And we allow, we search in an ith and jth direction displacement. So let's just make sure we understand. We have, let's assume that we only have one interrogation window in each image right now. Let's forget about the fact that we have ensemble particle images, but let's assume we have our first image we acquired and it only has one uh, interrogation window, and we have our second image we acquired that only has an interrogation window, okay? We have the first interrogation window B, A and we have the second one B. Uh, we're looking at the fluctuation at the kth and lth original pixel, and then we search in B at the kth plus i and the l plus j. And we can do this all over k l's, okay? And what we do is anytime we look at any displacement in the ith or j direction, we end up looking at a correlation coefficient, okay? And so what we, we would say, oops, let's go back. Again, you can imagine that when we find the proper displacement, the correlation coefficient will be high. When we find, as, as the correlation coefficient goes down, we're not properly matching the displacement, okay? So just take a look at this. This is just looking at a correlation coefficient. Again, this is not exactly how it's done because this would be an exceedingly slow process. You can see that what we're doing is trying to do a just complete search and find type algorithm in this process. So again, we're looking at correlation coefficients. 
First thing we see is why do we compute the correlation of the intensity fluctuation? It's to, to avoid uh, some, some spurious correlations that arise. The correlation coefficient that we would get uh, actually can be broken into three different terms. We can have a correlation actually between the, again, if you want to think about it, the mean background correlation, uh, the particle, and any particle movement in just the background. We can have the correlation between the mean intensity and intensity fluctuations. That's noise and particles. Any fluctuation from the mean can have a correlation, right? But what we're only interested in really is the, uh, the correlation between particles and particles. So if we subtract off the mean, uh, this correlate RC and RF go to zero. And really we can now track just the correlation between the movement of the particles. Or we can, we can't say, we say it goes away, that's a colloquial way to say it, but we can really suppress these different, these different components. So now we don't get bias between, because this is a statistical approach, we don't get, we don't get influence from movement and particles and noise and movement and particles and just the mean background intensity. We remove those components because we're really trying to pattern match and really look at correlation movement between a particle in image A and then in image B. Okay, So how would we do this if this is the way that we wanted to do the correlation? Well, again, look back at this. Again, image A, image B. All this is saying it's the fluctuation. Don't get worried about the subtraction. We're at the kth and lth pixel. Uh, we then shift up I, shift up J, or shift up I and move over J. We do every possible combination of movement of I's and J's, right? So basically all we're doing is shifting the second window with respect to the first at all possible locations, right? And we generate a correlation coefficient. We calculate, uh, we calculate the correlation coefficient. And the one that gives us the highest wins, right? So when the sum of the product intensities is low, it's a bad match. When it's pretty good, uh, sum of the product intensities is high. Sum of the product, all that means is we have a high correlation coefficient. Okay? So we could do this. In fact, this is how some of the original al algorithms were proposed and written. Um, so how would we do this? Uh, we would select an interrogation window. We call it, in very general, a pattern in the first image, call it P1. We would select a domain in the, in the second image where the pattern matching uh, between the first and second to, to be performed. Maybe you'd start in the exact same region. Maybe if you thought you knew the mean velocity, you would shift initially, but we would check P1. We would compare P1 to all possible P2s. All that means is that we're essentially taking an interrogation window in P2 and trying to move that pattern to see, ensure we get the highest correlation coefficient to try to find the, the movement. The two patterns with the maximum similarity uh, uh, that shouldn't be identical. Two patterns with max similarity are essentially the, the average displacement. Probably need to fix that. Um, the two displacements between the two centers of the two patterns is the average velocity of the interrogation window. Hopefully that conceptually makes sense. You would kind of search in every direction until you're essentially trying to warp the second one back to the first. When you can get those pattern match, then the displacement I had to move in the X and Y gives me an average vector, okay? So you could write this if you wanted to very simply in like MATLAB, it would take you forever uh, to, to run it, not to write it, you'd write it very quickly, you guys are bright. But it would take it forever to run and this is why. It's slow, it needs N times M squared computation time where n, t n and m are the width and heights of the pattern. Remember, that's just a single interrogation window. So that's my next bullet. You have to repeat this for all interrogation windows. So hopefully you're conceptually thinking this is how it works. You just have to search. You have to go and search everywhere, right, And when you maximize this. And this is just way too slow, okay? So the way that it's done is via FFT, and this greatly reduces the computation time. <laughs> For the interrogation window, this is what we're going to do. Let's say we have our two, now since we're coming out Fourier transform, we're going to refer to these interrogation windows, these ensemble particle images as signals F and G, right? So this is F at pixel LK at any point, okay? I'm just, so we have to look at every pixel. We have G at L of K. That's your second one, okay? Things have moved. I can, I've even graphically shown that, okay? But what I can do is take the FFT, take the Fourier transform, and I have the analog, Fourier analog, F and G. And then I can multiply the Fourier transform of F by the conjugate, G, 
And then my correlation coefficient then by definition is the inverse for a transform of this product. Okay? Now what will come out from that transform is actually uh, the delta x and delta y. Okay? Once you have delta x and delta y with your t, you have u and v. So this is how all modern processes work. They work in the Fourier domain, and it's very fast. Okay. So now let's look at the influence of our image, uh, our, our image number density. Really, again, how many particles am I putting in interrogation window? Okay. So let's say I only put five in. This is kind of the correlation. Remember, the correlation... Uh, is always going to give these false correlations, and then you're going to have one, one master peak. As I increase the number, the, we can see some of these other uh, uh, false or incorrect correlations are going to grow, and some actually die off. But again, I start to see a strong peak that emerges, and then this continues to grow as I increase, as I increase my uh, number of particles. Okay? So from this... Uh, original work in PIV sort of came up with, you know, uh, uh, kind of some criteria, which is kind of what we call a quote-unquote design rule, is that the more particles you get, the better the signal-to-noise ratio you get, and you really need around at least 10 uh, particles in interrogation window, 10 image particles uh, on average, okay? Uh, a minimum of four and, and at least 95%. These are kind of like the tails of the PDF of what you need. But think about this is just you really need about 10. You can see it when we start having these low amounts, it, the, the correlation peak is not that much higher than the background correlation. Okay? Now, we can certainly put in more, and you get, even, you, get, you get a better answer. This is not always possible with seeding systems. And again, we'll talk about the end of this when you have our change in density and reacting flows. It's, it would be what you would do to get this amount of seeding in the hot portions, you would have to put in six times as much in the cold, right? And therefore, then you would get speckle there, okay? So if there's a balance. Reacting flows, this is the main problem with reacting flows is getting nice uniform density seeding, okay? So if we think about also the other thing that comes in there is PTV, particle tracking, we can say in the limit that, well, regardless of how many you have in a region, a particle uses only, PTV uses only particle for the velocity estimate, right? I track the actual displacements. I use one particle. So it has some error E, whatever that error may be. In PIV, the error goes as the square root of N, a 1 over the square root of NI. So actually, the error in determining uh, the most probable displacement goes down as you get in an eye. Now notice I said the error in determining the most probable displacement. Does that actually mean that needs to represent the gas phase velocity? No, but the error in determining the most probable displacement goes down. So that's, that's uh, one thing we have to consider. So as you increase the amount of seeding in an interrogation window up to certain limits, you can actually have benefits and get better quality answers. All right, let's look at the influence of the particles moving in plane. Okay. So right now, what we have to do is just look at it from a correlation point of view, and, 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 and I'll try to explain this the best I can. This di, again, is going to be the size of this dimension of the correlation box, and I'm going to allow it to move delta x. Remember, this is the image, uh, the amount it moves, not necessarily in the real flow, but how much it moves in the image that I detect. Okay, and, and what we can do is define this quantity, fi, in terms of, one minus delta x over di and one minus fy over di. And the correlation, this is the displacement correlation. Remember, this is the one we want particle to particle. It sort of, it scales as ni uh, times, times f, okay? So as fi goes down, the correlation gets worse, okay? So you can think about this. This makes a lot of sense that if I have an image of particles and I don't let it move at all, and I correlate that image with itself, I should get really good correlation, right? I should correlate. If, that, if I take an image and correlate it with self, the correlation should be pretty high. I, I hope so, right, because you're correlating with itself. And so, so the correlation here is very high. Now, from a velocity point of view, this is a terrible idea because nothing has moved, 
and therefore your, your correlation may be high, but uh, so the correlation is going to be high, but the average displacement there is zero in your delta t, so that would tell you that the velocity is zero. So it doesn't make any sense, right? So you can say, okay, I'll just let it move just a little smidge, but then this is a whole dynamic range I want to get into in a second. That means that all your low velocities aren't, aren't moving at all, and they have air, okay? But this is just from a correlation point of view. Now let's allow them to move somewhere around a quarter of a box. Uh, and you go through and do this. Now this F parameter is going down clearly because there's just, this is just the quality band to determine the correlation. Uh, it just has to because the particles have moved. You can't, can't recover uh, the correlation as, as well. And therefore the correlation, the particle diameter is going to go down. And you can keep doing this on and on to you allow this thing to move essentially uh, in all directions uh, a tremendous amount. Okay? So from this work, these works were done computationally, and it's found that sort of the recommendation, many of you will know this, that you really don't want the particles to move than any more than one quarter of an interrogation window, okay, in the X and Y domain. So what this means is that you, as the user, you have your field of view, okay, which is a magnification, so you know how much each particle represents in terms of real space, you know what the sort of highest velocities you would expect or the mean velocities you would expect, and you use those to back out your delta t. Okay? That determines the spacing in between your laser. You set your spacing between the two laser sheets so that your maximum velocities move about a quarter of an interrogation window. Now, I'll come back to this, but this is for really old processing that did not use overlapping interrogation windows multiple passes. This is for just straightforward correlation, okay? So think about that. What you want to do is say, I want my maximum distance that I can move a particle to move as a quarter of an interrogation window. Well, then that means my, that should be my fastest velocity. Now, you can say to yourself, okay, why don't I move less than that because I'll get a better correlation? Well, that you're, it's absolutely true. But then, if you're letting whatever your fastest velocity is moving, your slower is clearly moving less, right? And as they move less and less, although their correlation may become stronger, at some point it becomes, you can't actually resolve a correlation when the particle displacement is so small, the correlation just becomes nonsense. So the reason why you try to let particles move about as far as you can is to increase your dynamic range, your velocity dynamic range, so that you can accurately capture high velocities and low velocities versus just the highest velocity, okay? So that's, that's one of the things. Okay. Now, what about out-of-plane displacement? We, we, one that I won't say is forgotten, but we have a laser sheet. And again, this is just regular uh, either plane or stereo. Our particles are three-dimensional motion. They can move in and out of the sheet. Okay? So we have to deal with this the exact same way. Again, if we don't allow them to move out of the sheet, this is just defined. This is a similar F0 now as a function of Z is defined as their movement. Uh, out of sheet. If we don't allow the move out of sheet, this quantity is one, uh, and our correlation uh, remains strong. As we allow it to move more and more out of the sheet, the correlation gets worse and worse. Okay, as you can imagine, even if I have an image, you know, if I take that image and move it down some distance purely in, the, say, the xy plane, then I'm subject to the reduction in the correlation co coefficient just due to fi, which was on the previous screen. Now, if I allow particles to actually disappear as they go out of the plane too, I further reduce my correlation by this quantity f0. Okay? So what, we, what generally has happened as well is that through some early computation, sorry, using synthetic data, the recommendation is also that the out-of-plane displacement should be less than a quarter of uh, the light sheet thickness, okay, to keep the correlation pretty high, okay? Now, so what this says is that you have to know a little bit about your flow and you have to know what the out-of-plane motion is, the strong uh, flow that's normal to your laser sheet. You know, like if you're working, let's say, in an actual image where you have very strong what could be out-of-plane uh, flow or flows that don't have a principal flow component, this can be a significant, which really makes that you're gonna, uh, implies that you're going to have to thicken your sheet. Lots of times in engine work, you have to have very late, thick laser sheets just to ensure that the particles stay within, uh, stay within the laser sheet. 
Okay, so that's another consideration. So sort of uh, what happens is these turned out to be sort of based in uh, early 90s where PIV was starting to become its first level of maturity. These were the uh, design rules. You want your image density to be greater than 10, meaning I need to see 10 particles or more in my interrogation window. I need my in-plane in motion in my image, that's what capital X is, to be less than one quarter of the interrogation window. I need my out-of-plane motion to be less than a quarter of the laser sheet thickness. And then this is one we didn't talk about, but I thought I'd go ahead and put it up here. There was one also on spatial gradients to be able to resolve, and this is just a secondary uh, criteria. But the one thing I want to note that these, these rules, as they're sometimes called, are actually guidelines. And they're really more applicable for traditional PIV uh, without consideration for more modern multipass algorithms and overlapping deforming windows. For example, if you have multipass algorithms, it's, it's pretty common that you'll start with a very coarse, say, 64 by 64 box, and you'll work your way down to, say, 32 by 32 to 16. You actually, because these boxes are actually moved in space as well, kind of the design rule that's adapted is sort of one quarter of the largest interrogation window. So you can actually let something move like 16 pixels if you want to. Now, you do have to come with the fact that you've assumed that it's moving linear over that. So that's a whole different issue. But assuming it was, you can actually let it move that, and because the windows are adaptive in nature, uh, they, they're, um, they, they're, uh, they're consistent locally, and they can, they can actually find very high correlations. So again, keep these in mind. They also take no consideration of uh, deforming windows that align themselves in principal gradients. You have a lot more uh, um, leniency in there, but there's a whole lot of papers if, again, you're using more of these advanced methods, make sure that you go to the literature to see what the recommendations are. Okay? What I wanted to do is more give you an idea of the things that can affect your measurements, meaning image density and these type of motion. What you want to do is keep in mind that if you allow things to move too much, the correlations go lower, and when the correlations go lower, your estimation of the particle displacements get worse, and if your estimation of the particle displacements get worse, then your estimation of the velocity gets worse. Okay. Let's look at uncertainty in dynamic range. Okay, so we'll also follow analysis from now some later 90s work by Ron Agent. We'll assume that we have diffraction limited imaging and Gaussian noise. Okay. All right, so let's assume we have an uncertainty. We want the uncertainty of a velocity component, so we'll call that sigma ui, and that's going to be sigma delta x lower delta, uh, small x over delta t. So small x is the particle displacement actual in the fluid plane, the actual real displacement, and then it's related to the uncertainty in the image plane, which is capital X via the relationship with magnification. So uh, Adrian suggests that the uncertainty in the movement in the image plane is just equal to some constant C tau times D tau. I'll talk about those in a second. C tau is just a constant particular to a different algorithm. It's usually 5 to 10%, so 0.05 to 0 0.1. Uh, and it's just an ability of whatever algorithm to determine the displacement. You, you have to have some uncertainty in your software and your algorithm as well because everyone writes it different. Now D tau is an image diameter. Uh, that's uh, the sum of the squares, uh, d tau squared is di squared plus dr squared, where di is the image, is diameter of the optical image, we've talked about that, and dr is actually the resolution of the camera, so this now actually takes into account the actual real resolution or your, kind of your projected pixel area, okay? So the, here we go, the optical image diameter, going back to that, again, we have our actual real particle, and then we have whatever our Blur size is, and again, if we assume we're diffraction limited, we can substitute those in. So what that means is that our uncertainty in our, the, the ith component of our velocity is a function of this uh, C tau. We have our particle uh, diameter, we have our blur spot size, and we actually have the resolution. So actually, what we're doing is we're, we're increasing the numerator quite a bit, so that means the uncertainty is going up, right? So it's not just... Uh, it's not just uncertainty in one of these. We have to consider all three of these components. Okay? Now, if we want to look at, uh, oh, let me go back. Let me make sure I made this very clear. I think I made it. Um, so we have, and then we divide by delta t. I didn't even say that. So again, you can see we have the uncertainty 
just in this UI is now related to this is kind of the constant. These are kind of, this is our ability to detect a movement if you think about that, what, what that is. Now, that's why I want to make some comments on. If we have a certain spot size and a certain resolution of particle, this is sort of a glorified way of our ability to detect any movement in the particle. This is kind of the limitation of the detector to detect if a particle moves a little bit or a lot, right? This is kind of our sensitivity to particle movement once it's transferred onto the image plane. Okay? All right, so we can also use these exact same expressions to get the dynamic range. So that last one, we determine the uncertainty. Let's assume that the uncertainty is the smallest resolvable fluctuation. So anything below these are the noise floor. Say the uncertainty is just usually epsilon above the uncertainty, you would say, is the smallest fluctuation I can resolve. Okay? The dynamic range is going to be defined as the ratio of the largest possible velocity to the velocity uncertainty. We're going to let our maximum possible velocity move one quarter of the interrogation box. Okay, so uh, what we have here is we substitute all of that in. Oops, go back. And we end up with this expression here that the dynamic range can be uh, our delta XP max over delta T PIV, uh, and those two will cancel. And then we have CT over DT. Okay, so this will give you a dynamic range of your velocity. This is usually about, comes out to be a calculation of about 150 to 200. That, though, if you think about what that's saying, that what we want that to say is that's the dynamic range of velocities that we can calculate, which sounds pretty good. If I have 100 meters a second, I can characterize everything down to 0.5 meters per second. What this is telling us is the dynamic range of your ability to detect some movement uh, from the correlation algorithm. Not exactly the same. And so there are, there's, there are some questions on whether or not this is a suitable uh, definition on, on dynamic range of actually the velocity that's derived from that because you have to throw in accuracy there. Anything at the extreme end of tiny movement is going to have very poor accuracy. Okay? But again, this is, your ability, this is the dynamic uh, range uh, based on the ability to detect particle movement. All right, let's, let's work back through our dimensionality again. This is the slide that's just copied from the last lecture. Again, remind ourselves planar PIV gives us two components in a plane. Stereoscopic PIV gives us three components in a plane. Tomographic gives us three components in a volume. So stereoscopic PIV, we talked about this. We need the shine flu condition, uh, condition to be satisfied. Again, our lens plane, object plane, and the image plane all intersect at a common line. So now let's talk about what this, this is doing. This actually leads to strong perspective distortion. Uh, so what happens is if we're on the left camera, we're actually, let's look at what I have here. Let's say our true displacement was this purple vector, right? Velocity moved in this way. Well, I would project, I would see this in a certain way. Uh, once I'm, uh, I would see this inverted, okay, uh, in this direction. That's why they're, they're written in this manner. Um, but l let's say we don't invert them. So the red would be this view, and blue is this view, right? You can imagine you take that vector and, and project it to two-dimensional space, okay? So I would, I would, see, uh, I would see movement uh, that is not this true three-dimensional movement because I'm looking at it from this perspective, okay? So the way that we have to do that is we need to calibrate our system, okay? And this is corrected by mapping function, okay? They're generally second order. They can be higher order, but they're matrix that transform the pixel coordinate system into a real world system. So really you have, uh, you image a common target, okay? Uh, that you know both, are, both cameras are looking at the exact same grid. They're just looking at them from a different perspective. They will look distorted based on their perspective but then with that calibration, you actually can end up with the grid one and grid two. You actually can end up with the same rep representation of that single grid from both cameras, okay? Um, in order to do this, though, you need a model of how objects in space are mapped to the sensor, and this is what's referred to as a planar projection model. We need to uh, be able to describe how, when we're looking at an object plane, we have perspective distortion, how that actually gets mapped. That model's pretty good. 
Um, but they are, they do have parameters, parameters that float or free parameters. And so the model parameters actually come from calibration. So you have calibration targets. Again, you put a calibration target in, look from both sides, you eventually be, you're able to recover uh, both images. Okay? Now, one thing that's in stereo, the field of view that is available is only that's covered from both cameras. So each image is looking, if you will, a trapezoidal region, right? And so you end up with this carved out region. You only have the one that's common to both cameras. Okay? So this is sort of how it looks. These are examples. This is left and right. Uh, you, if you look closely, you can actually see some difference in the particle images. You can see the left and right, they actually have some perspective uh, di uh, difference. So what you do in, in processing, and this is usually handled internally, is that you perform conventional PIV processing on both images. You produce a two vector fields, two two-dimensional, two-component vector fields. One is seen from the left and one right. So you have one left and one right image, okay? So you have two PIV fields. You have the camera model, okay, from your targets. Uh, so you have the camera model and the points in the, in the interrogation grid are mapped from the object plane onto left and right image planes. So essentially you have calibration from your targets. These are camera images viewed from the two different cameras and they each have a different level of perspective, okay? Now what happens is you have, again, you have these 2D maps. They're all resampled into a new common uh, image. That's the common area that overlaps first, we cut off the rest. And then the vectors at the individual points of each image are not necessarily going to be a same common uh, set of axes, right? So you have to resample into a common, kind of new common pixel space. And then you, you combine them and you generate a, a 2D, 2C component. What this is is the vectors are the end plane. Uh, what you would get from traditional PIV, and the color is the out-of-plane velocity. And the way you do that is that, again, you have these two two-dimensional uh, displacement maps, uh, but, they're, but now resampled to the same point in physical space. Once you do this, this is just actual fairly simple uh, geometry and trigonometry. So you can actually determine just through geometric relationships the 3D displacement. And all of this is handled internally in terms, of, in terms of commercial PIV software. But the whole idea is coming that once you, if you take uh, calibration images of a target, okay, uh, that are in common space, again, you need to be able to transfer the perspective distortion, remove that such that you can end up with an image that can actually estimate the out-of-plane component. The nice thing about uh, stereo is that the, if done right, the actual in-plane components are, are more accurate than traditional planar uh, PIV as well. Um, because you, you can, you're actually, uh, you're, in some ways, you're moving a lot of this effect of the out-of-plane because in some way in your 2D, your, your, any of your out-of-plane motion, right, ends up as estimated in, in, as two-dimensional in-plane motion, no matter what, because you lose particles. In this way, because you're, you're mapping the actual out-of-plane motion from the perspective, you're getting a true or better representation of the actual in-plane motion. So the, the in-plane velocity vectors should be more accurate in stereo PIV than they are in traditional planar PIV. All right, tomographic PIV, okay? Now, instead of having a planar projection model, we need to replace this with a more general 3D measurement domain, okay? So this is a little bit more complicated. So we, we, change, uh, we change our laser sheet with the slab. Typically, the recommendation is that the thickness of the laser sheet is about one quarter uh, of the width of the field of view, okay? You can make it thicker or thinner, uh, but again, you need energy. You actually you need to think you need to be able to get enough signal coming from these particles, okay? So as your laser slab gets thicker and thicker, you need more laser energy. So for very kind of wide, uh, slabs, the laser energies coming out of these are hundreds of millijoules, so they're, they're very energetic. Uh, all the particles need to be in focus, so that means you need a very large depth of field, which if you'll remember, that means we need a very high F number. So that means we're collecting even less signal at this point. Okay, we need to turn our F number up so that our, what we're collecting, so that we can get all these particles. So it's kind of, it's kind of, it works against you. 
if you want a larger, thicker and thicker volume, a larger volume, you need to have a larger, larger depth of focus, which means you need to turn your F number up, but because you're having a larger and larger uh, you need even more laser energy, and then since you've made your F number higher, you need even more laser energy. So th these large volume measurements are actually quite difficult to do. Okay. Now, the commonly method to reconstruct these particle fields is MART, uh, multiplicative algebraic reconstruction. You basically have, you need a 3D representation of the particle field, and, and you want to do it with as small number of projections as, particle, as possible. Uh, this is really allowed because you have particles, okay? Particles can be reconstructed uh, reasonably from a smaller number of uh, projections. Uh, we know that just from medical imaging, right, if you have an uh, MRI or you have a CT, you need a large number of views. That thing moves around you continuously because you, you essentially what you're looking at is uh, is a continuous structure, okay? And so uh, the, the more discrete it is, the less number of projections you need. But also, there's other sides. These reconstruction techniques are actually meant to, were developed originally in kind of medical where you had light and dark, you know, from contrast of different types of imaging. Uh, and so they, they have some, they, they can have some issues. Although these are really getting good. People are really working hard at uh, new uh, reconstruction techniques. So the first step is you need to reconstruct the particle field and volume, uh, and then you, uh, then you actually have calibrations very similar to stereo PIV, but again, now you do this at multiple depths, okay, and the precision of your calibrations become much stricter, okay? And then once you have a reconstructed particle volumes, you have 3D cross-correlation, okay? Now, one thing that I would really like to refer you all to is if you're doing tomographic, if you don't already have it, this is an excellent paper by Scarano. It's from uh, 2013, Tomographic PIV Principles and Practices. So instead of me developing slides, basically I would have been cutting and pasting, and that's, you don't need that. Uh, this is an excellent resource for doing tomographic PIV. Okay? All right, let's talk a little bit about limitations. And this is probably one of the more important topics I want to convey within here. So PIV is a significant tool in fluid mechanics in turbulent reacting flows, but there are some inherent limitations. So it's what's referred to as a non-dense estimate of the velocity field. You get one velocity vector per interrogation window, okay? Not a vector per pixel. You can get overlap and you can get more velocity vectors than interrogation windows right when you have overlap. But actually fundamentally the resolution is limited by the size of the interrogation. It gets a little bit better with, with overlap, but not, it does not go as the degree of overlap. Okay? So what you find is that for, velo for velocity measurements, the spatial resolution of the velocity measurement is typically about an order of magnitude. Uh, uh, Spatial resolution about order of magnitude worse is the better way to say that than of the detector. Okay. So let's think about what, what can happen. Let's say you have a higher Reynolds number flow, uh, and so you have very small length scales. What can happen is, is, let's say this is your interrogation box. Within your turbulent flow, this could be the structure you have. You could have gradients, you could have internal structure, because the length scales may only be, let's say, one-tenth of, of a dimension of this interrogation box. But you go through and do the correlation analysis and you apply and you give it one vector. What you can see is this vector may or may not represent, uh, it may represent the average, it uh, may not, okay? And so when you, you have strong gradients that do exist and the vector that you get may not be actually representative of the fluid mechanics that's happening in that region. And so the reason why you also, the other thing that's problematic from an analysis point of view is that when you have large local gradients, you actually end up getting unequal particle displacement. We talked about that. This then leads to multiple correlation peaks, and you end up can getting more bias error actually in, in, in the measurement, okay? So uh, really the lack of spatial resolution uh, is, is problematic for, for, uh, for many reasons. Okay. So also when you have poor spatial resolution, we know that a gradient is the 
rate of change. So spatial gradient would be the rate of change of the quantity divided by the change in position. If we have pretty poor spatial resolution, we're going to also affect our gradients. Okay, so really PIV can be considered as a low pass filter, or the estimation from uh, the velocity from PIV can be considered as a low pass filtered version of the true velocity field. Uh, and derivative quantities can be underestimated. So this is what I want to show. This is using 2D DNS as an example. I'll use, you'll see this show up a lot tomorrow in, in a lot of the analysis I show. But let's say this was synthetic and we had a particle field. Uh, this is a DNS where the particle fields were calculated uh, for that actual particle field. And then you apply a PIV algorithm to it. This is actually what the vorticity field looks like if you apply, this is a 16 by 16 with 50% overlap. So that's not, a, that's not the most aggressive. I'll show you tomorrow with PIV, you can do, do much better when comparing this to other results. But that is not uh, a, a terrible approach. I mean, it's pretty common to see, especially in reacting flows, because because of the change in density, you have to back off a bit on your aggressiveness of your PIV strategy. This is 16 by 16, 50% uh, overlap. And you can see that the vorticity field is substantially uh, uh, filtered out. And this isn't that surprising. When you look at sort of vorticity fields that come out of PIV in the literature, they, they sometimes look like these kind of Lego block type uh, vorticity fields. You know? And so um, now, I shouldn't say that there's a lot of work that's been done in PIV. There's a lot of people that are doing great work that are getting higher and higher resolution and, and, and making uh, uh, great contributions. So I just wanted to point out for maybe, I won't call it a worst case, but let's just say a, a, a mid case uh, somewhere in the middle that these derivative quantities can be quite underestimated and you can significantly lose structure from the vorticity. Okay. Now if we move to reacting flows, we have to consider that we have challenges. That's another thing you guys want to know. And it's particle seeding. And I think many of you know this. Tracer particles must survive in not chemically react, so we can't use like oil droplets, we can't use smoke, we can't use things that are done in non-reacting flows, they typically have to be ceramics. So we have titanium dioxide, silicon dioxide. So we put in the ceramics, but these ceramics uh, tend to cluster in larger sizes, so we've talked about this, they cluster in sizes in the cedar and the lines, uh, add any kind of moisture to it, these things jump up together, they, and so their ability to follow the flow can, can diminish. So this becomes, becomes a challenge. Because the density gradients that exist, uniform seeding can be a challenge. Okay. Here's an example that I just that I took from our measurements. This is kind of a measurement in a non-reacting non jet that's pretty uniform seeded for an experiment. Okay. This is a turbulent jet too. So all the fluid mechanics here is crazy, but you still get very fairly uniform particle seeding. This is a non-premixed jet. You can clearly see this was the cold and this was the hot, right? And so you see these significant, and these, this co-flow is seeded. This isn't a case where we haven't seeded stuff. This is actually just a change of, of seed density. And here's kind of, a, kind of an extreme example on a premixed flame where you've seeded in uh, droplets uh, heavily in the reacting. They go through the very high temperature and you can see the much sparser representation. Again, if the particles follow the gas density for something that's, say, maybe 2100 Kelvin, you're going to have a factor of seven change in the density, okay? And so you can have significant uh, changes in the seed density. Other, di other issues in reacting flows become flame luminosity. We talked about this a little earlier. And then thermophoretic forces. But again, thermophoresis, essentially a movement due to thermal gradient, high to low temperature. Uh, Again, if you have a really small particle, this can become quite a, quite a problem. But for the particle sizes we use and in turbulent flames, again, with the motion that's being moved due to convection, this is usually a, a minor, minor issue. Okay. Oh, I, I add one last, so you can guys can see some PIV uh, examples. Okay. So it's always good to kind of look at the end of, even though it seems like I'm pointing out some of the limitations, Here's some of the more interesting things you can do with them, or I, I like, or some of the examples I like best. This is a PIV OH plif in a low swirl flame. Basically, again, using simultaneous PIV plif to look at how this velocity flow field is interacting uh, with the flame front. It gives you a lot of information on whether the turbulence is in, in impacting the, the flame front or vice versa. 
Uh, again, we can look at these unsteady interactions uh, in, in a, again, the same model gas turbine. So this is a simultaneous OH plif, and we'll talk about the plifs uh, uh, starting maybe, I think it's tomorrow. Uh, we have our fuel tracer plif in acetone. We have OH that's given us the high temperature gases, and then they're simultaneously work with uh, uh, high temperature. And what's really nice is if you look in this region right here, you have this vortex. You can see this vortical structure, right, that basically swirls up and kind of uh, mixes out this unreacted fluid and brings in this high temperature gas. And so it's kind of a really cool example. You can see kind of the, the blue goes away, and this blue goes away, and then this red forms. So it's a really good example of uh, PIV. Here's the, the path lines, streak lines that are formed from the velocity measurements. Uh, this is a work from Texas, uh, Noel Clemens group, and, and basically you looking at uh, tomographic PIV and uh, during flashbacks, so you can actually look at the velocity, the three-dimensional velocity and gradients uh, leading up as the flame propagates forward. And then just measurements that, that we've done, just time resolved measurements, really to give you an idea of the level of fluctuation uh, that exists in, in a lot of these turbulent flames, it's significant. And again, that just kind of shows uh, some of the payoff of working through some of these, these measurements and trying to do careful, uh, kind of careful experiments. Okay, and with that, that since that's just eye candy to end the day, uh, I'll take any questions and, and we'll finish the lecture. Any questions? Yes, yes, go ahead. Oh, if your calibration plate does not span the complete field of view, then you really only have, your coefficients are only coming from the information that you have, and then you're essentially doing a level of interpolation uh, too. So if it's a well-controlled kind of regular signal, you're fine, but if the perspective distortion, which tends to be worse near the edges, uh, it could be a problem. I can't like, quantify, but uh, I would encourage to have a plate that, that covers the entire field of view. That certainly is, is preferred. If not, you have to live with the fact that you're projecting your calibration factors to areas where they don't exist. Yes? Yes? So what happens is that the biggest, the easiest way to say this is that it basically obscures a lot of your particles, right? The correlation can't really, it's still at the end of the day, correlation is trying to pattern match and use an intensity. And if it obscures a lot of your particles, it'll show up in what you can call noise because you'll start to get these false peaks, right? And the correlation becomes weaker and weaker, okay? And, and the quality of the velocity vectors goes as the quality of the correlation, okay? Really, the biggest issue is that you're just masking out your particles and you end up with an effect of low number of particles and the, therefore your image density is really low. And then we saw the effects as the image density goes low, you, you have your results get worse and worse. Other questions? Okay, well, I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks. Have a good night.